Hello. Uh, today we're looking at World War I again, and this is the first part was about the causes of the war, um, or some of the causes of the war, and this is about the opening stages of the war, the beginning of the war. In an hour, you can't cover everything. Lots of things going to be left out, but uh, hopefully we can look at the general course of the opening stages, get, make a little sense of it. To understand World War II, you really need to understand the First World War because uh, one way of looking at it is that they were the same war in two parts. The World War Part One, 1914 to 1918. The World War Part Two, 1939 to 1945. And the present World War, the Cold War, 1944 to today. So you could in some ways look at it as an ongoing conflict with different players for 102 years are going on 102 years. Just drinking a, an expensive, you might say cheap, would be accurate, light ice, ice lager, Milwaukee's best ice. They had these two for $3, these quart cans at um, Circle K. Now, this is a book that I bought. It's from 1916, and it's called um, uh, The State Papers. The, uh, the Story of the Great War, Volume 2, Diplomatic and State Papers. It's an American book. It was published before the U.S. entered the war in April 1917. So it's got a lot of interesting photographs in there of uh, warships and players in the war. Uh, P.F. Collier and Son are the publishers. Um, Chapter one is interesting though. It, it, the opening paragraph says this, overshadowing all other issues which brought the European nations into conflict loomed the fundamental differences between Great Britain and Germany. A large body of expert opinion not inadequ inadequately substantiated by accumulation of symptoms and events held that the war as between those two countries was due to commercial jealousy which had fomented so long that any unrelated incident would suffice to bring on a war. Certainly, this is what happened. So the, the general viewpoint of this book is that the root cause of the World War Part One was this uh, decades-long building, they're saying mainly economic rivalry between the two empires, German and British, and also political rivalry. Uh, there was just a increasingly dislike between those two countries for each other. Uh, one thing we can learn from this uh, war is that um, these countries really need to, uh, these countries in Europe really needed to avoid any sort of generalized conflict, that it wasn't that it was to no one's advantage to do this. And it's funny because you read all the uh, history about the different leaders and their general viewpoint was that they did not want to have a world war and that if they did have a world war, the consequences would be disastrous for all the parties involved. So we know one way they tried to, uh, to protect themselves was to, uh, an arms race, building huge navies and land armies didn't really help them win so much but it did make the war likely to last longer uh, a system of alliances which were supposed to protect each country which but which in fact did not protect the members of the alliances but made it more likely that you you would be dragged into a war that was to help someone else who didn't have your best interests at heart so um and I guess the third lesson is war is almost never the answer. 99 times out of 100, it's the, it's a terrible mistake. Uh, I cannot read this whole book to you. That's It's so interesting because it's state papers. And it must have been a job to put these together. Um, put this on the side. 
might reference this later. Another interesting book is The New Map of Europe, 1911 to 1914. An English book that discussed how uh, Europe, this is from 1915, how Europe had a new map. And it's generally an anti-German book, pro-British, but naturally it's written in Great Britain. But um, you can still learn a lot about it, about the situation by reading the book. Um, and I would highly recommend it if you can get it. And you can get most of these books on interlibrary exchange if you don't have the book in your library. And then the last chapter, Germany forces the war upon Russia and France. Well, <clears throat> okay. We know that on June 28, 1914, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Habsburg Empire, was assassinated by a uh, Gavrilo Princip, an uh, uh, ethnic Serbian, part of a uh, assassination team of teenagers, some in their early 20s. This led to a crisis between Austria-Hungary and Serbia. Without a system of alliances, it would just be a localized war, nothing too unusual for Europe. They have an, they're having a low-level war right now between Russia and Ukraine. Um, well, what happened in a general sense, not in a specific sense? We cannot get into too many specifics because the video would last 10 hours. But Austria was in a crisis, and they discussed this with the Germans and their allies and the Triple Alliance. Also, Italy was an ally which made almost no sense. But um, the Germans were telling the Austrians, yes, yes, you have to take action against the Serbians. They're a band of robbers. That's what the Kaiser of Germany called them. He said, uh, you know, it's the, the general attitude was that Austria was sort of on a precipice. They had all these ethnic groups under the empire. And if they didn't take action against the Serbs, the empire would just start to collapse. So, um, and that Serbia was a threat and needed to be dealt with. So, um, the Germans did have some, not necessarily proof, but they had a feeling that there was a plot by France and Russia against Germany. And it turns out there was a secret accord that France and Russia did sign in 1894 that said that it would be their policy to, at some opportune time, attack Germany from both sides and t take large amounts of land from them. And they acted in a way that seemed to prove that this was the case. So Germany also was concerned that uh, Russia was on, under this five-year modernization program, and they felt like if it went up to 1919 or 1920, that Russia and France would be very modernized and if a war broke out at that point, they would have no chance of winning. Whereas in 1914, they 1914 they might have a chance. There was not a general viewpoint of the Kaiser in the German High Command that they would win, just that they possibly could win. So they they felt like they were a country under siege. Although the whole German Empire was established by aggression towards its neighbors, including German states. The British had always been an aggressive country. That's how they built their empire through uh, aggression and imperialism. So they 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 had no problem with this. Now, uh, but they were good at spinning it in a way that made it look like they were being attacked and they were forced into war. When it was almost never the case. Sometimes it was. Usually it was not. Italy had nothing to gain from war and everything to lose. So they should have been like Switzerland and absolutely not in any alliance and the Turks had no interest in this war and they should have stayed out because they had nothing to gain and everything to lose. Russia was on the cusp of an internal revolution since at least 1905 and further back than then but the crisis came to a head in 1905 so they had communist revolutionaries operating inside of Russia and they were very powerful well they were relatively powerful compared to other countries you know and so um, it was a 
to Russia's great advantage not to go into this war. Um, but they want to they want to be the big player in the in southeastern Europe, the Balkans, and the um, Eastern Europe. So they feel like they have to have that presence. And then France, they had a big empire. They didn't have anything to gain from this war. But France figured they uh, could get back at Germany and get some land back, Alsace and Lorraine, which Germany had taken from them in 1871. After, of course, France had taken that land from Germany in eight in 1648. So they had this beef between each other for a long time. Austria wanted to present Serbia with an ultimatum that would be so strict and, and hard and difficult to deal with that they could not accept it. And then they would basically have to go to war. But the way Austria wanted to play it, Austria-Hungary, is that they would present our, uh, Serbia with these demands and then Serbia could not comply, and then they could attack, and then hope everybody would stay out of it. Now, the German viewpoint was telling Austria, no, no, you don't have time to drag this out, because then more and more people can jump in. Now, they told Austria-Hungary, we backing you up, so if you attack, we'll help you. you we're, we're allies, and we're encouraging you, but you need to do it quickly. So in the early days, of, in the early weeks, or days, and or weeks of uh, July 1914, the sense of crisis had sort of passed. Things kind of calmed down, but the Germans were telling Austria, attack now, and then you, you'll have sort of a fail complete. Like, it'll be done, and the Europeans won't have time to react. You'll punish Serbia, maybe take some land from them, or at least, you know, make them pay for what they did, and uh, then it'll blow over and you can keep your reputation or they they say in japan save face and then everybody else won't jump into it but austria was a kind of a dithering country they they say oh no we don't know what to do you know so they, they and so on one hand here's germany saying you got to do it fast you got to do this fast this cannot drag out and then austria saying well we're gonna, we're gonna do something you know and so that's what happened they they drug it out and they just they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do. And they, they want to attack, but maybe they don't want to attack and they're not ready. And they, they just such an indecisive country practically at all times in their history. So finally, you know, they presented the ultimatum and then Russia did jump in, just like Germany's predicting. Russia jumps in and says, oh, you can't, you know, they're telling Serbia, don't accept those, those outrageous terms. You got to keep your pride uh, as a country. Now, Serbia probably would have accepted them if Russia hadn't been in there helping, because when Bill Clinton and the and NATO alliance presented Serbia with an ultimatum known as Yugoslavia then, in 1999, they did have to comply, and they were attacked. Russia was angry about it, but they, it happened so quickly that Russia wasn't able to intervene. And also, um, Russia had a lot of internal problems in 1999 with a, a president who was, you know, dying really, and, and Putin was trying to take over because of this, uh, like, sort of like non-functioning Russian government. So they they weren't really in a position to do much with Boris Yeltsin's illness, mental and physical. But um, so Russia gets involved, and they are saying, don't don't accept the uh, provisions of the ultimatum, the 12 point ultimatum. So Serbia feels like, okay, Russia is gonna step in, it's gonna scare Austria-Hungary off, and then we'll negotiate, we'll accept some of the provisions, and then the rest we won't accept, and then we won't really get punished. And you gotta remember, the people in Serbia were all excited when the man was murdered and his wife was murdered. They were all like, yay, hooray. Uh, we killed this bad guy. So the Austrian attitude was you celebrating the murder of our future ruler. There's no way you're not going to pay. I talked about this in the last video. If the if the future leader or the leader of the country is killed and they know who did it, somebody's getting hit. I mean, that's the way it's going to happen. It's somebody's going to get hit. And that wasn't really, like I said before in the other video, there wasn't really an argument there. All the European powers, their attitude was, yeah, we would do the same thing. It's just that they had this background, Kansas City Southern Railroad. There's this background animosity which leads to the crisis coming to a head. Okay, so the British, of course, 
they're monitoring everything. They're hoping to stay out of the war, but if it develops in a way that they don't see as favorable, in other words, Germany getting the upper hand, the upper hand in Europe, then they're going to jump in. They're going to find some way to jump in. If it could just be some low-level war, sort of like what broke out in 1870, they would just watch it. They didn't have a formal alliance with France and Russia, by the way. They had the triple entente, which was really the triple understanding. They had an understanding that if a war broke out, they would more than likely jump in together. But it wasn't really a formal alliance. Russia and France had a formal alliance. Okay. So finally, July continues on. And as it becomes clear that Austria is really going to press the issue and Serbia is actually not going to accept the ultimatum, then people start to really get worried. And the Kaiser in Germany is very worried. He's sort of in a panic. And the Austrians are concerned. But now they've made these statements, so they can't really back down. You know, and um, Winston Churchill, you know, he's always involved in all these wars. You know, he, he says he's the basically, we would call it the Secretary of the Navy in the United States. He issues an order for the, it's interesting, he issued an order for the British Navy to begin preparations to begin uh, shadowing possible enemies. So he's not saying shadow the German Navy. He's saying get ready to shadow the German Navy. Well, how are you going to get ready to shadow the German Navy if you're not shadowing the German Navy? you got to find out where the ships are. So it's obviously they're at a very close level to getting involved. And he's telling the King George V, we're not involved, but we're looking at the situation very carefully. The Germans seem to suspect that this is going on. So their instructions to their naval forces, you know, watch the watchers. All right. Where it really comes to a head is when Russia mobilizes their army. Now, they, the Germans knew this was going to happen, and they told the the uh, Kaiser, uh, don't, you know, uh, I'm talking about Kaiser um, of Russia, Nicholas II. They said, don't mobilize your army because if you mobilize your army, which is basically putting the troops on the march toward the border without a declaration of war, we're going to interpret it as a declaration of war. We're not going to stand around while you cock, you know, you load the gun, you point it at our head and you cock it and then say, well, we probably are not going to shoot. So when, when it became clear that Russia was going to mobilize their army. Now, the reason Mar Russia mobilized their army was to scare Austria-Hungary into backing down. Well, it scared them, all right. <laughs> the, you know, they can't back down now. They've made the ultimatum. So um, here's the Kaiser and the Tsar exchange telegrams. So uh, William II received the following telegram from Nicholas II. Here we are on... Um, July 29th. Here's Wilhelm II, uh, Hohenzollern. Here's the telegram he received from Nicholas. This is Nicholas writing, I'm glad that you are back in Germany. In this serious moment, I ask you earnestly to help me. To help me. It, an ignominious war has been declared against a weak country, and in Russia, the indignation which I fully share is tremendous. I fear, I fear that very soon I shall be unable to resist the pressure ex ex exercised upon me, and then I shall be feared, uh, forced to take measures which will lead to war. To prevent a calamity, as a European war would be, I urge you in the name of our old friendship to do all in your power to restrain your ally from going to, too far. The Kaiser replied, at 6.30 p.m. with his telegram. I have received your telegram, and I share your desire for the conservation of peace. Now, you can, you can read an underlying uh, tension building with these telegrams. However, I cannot, as I told you in my first telegram, consider the, a the action of Austria-Hungary as an ignominious war. Austria-Hungary knows from experience that the promises of Serbia, as long as they are merely on paper, are entirely unreliable. 
<clears throat> according to my opinion, the action of Austria-Hungary is to be considered as an attempt to receive full guarantee that the promises of Serbia are effectively translated into deeds. In this opinion, I am strengthened by the explanation of the Austrian cabinet that Austria-Hungary intended no territorial gain at the expense of Serbia. I am therefore of opinion that it is perfectly possible for Russia to remain a spectator in the Austro-Serbian war without drawing Europe into the most terrible war it has ever seen. I believe that a direct understanding is possible and desirable between your government and Vienna, the capital of Austria, an understanding which, as I have already telegraphed you, my government endeavors to aid with all possible effort. Naturally, military measures by Russia, which might be construed as a menace by Austria-Hungary, <laughs> would accelerate a calamity which both of us desire to avoid and would undermine my position as mediator, which upon your appeal to my friendship and aid, I will willingly accepted. Here's the czar's answer. Thanks for your telegram, which I, which is conciliatory and friendly, whereas the official message presented today by your ambassador to my minister was conveyed in a very different tone. I beg you to explain this divergency. It would be right to give over the Austro-Serbian problem to the Hague Tribunal. I trust your wisdom and friendship. And this goes on and on. <laughs> and uh, then if you read these, they become more panicked, you know, uh, and they're calling each other Willy, uh, Nikki. <laughs> um, well, unfortunately, Kaiser William II Hohenzollern, his, his first cousin was George V of Great Britain. George V of the House of Saxe, Coburg, and Gotha, by the way, still the ruling House of Great Britain, although they changed their name to the House of Windsor in 1917 to try to um, obscure the fact that it was a German royal family. He was also the first cousin of Nicholas II of Russia, so uh, these are these guys are not unrelated. But they're nationalists and they, they stick by their country first. Now, uh, yes, if they had turned this over to the Hague, it probably would have, you know, in, in, it could have avoided this disaster. This tells us that these European countries should have a cooperative arrangement. I'm not saying the European Union, this socialist macro government, I mean a cooperative arrangement where they, they trade together freely and they interact freely. Well, we, you may not know what happened, but we that study history know what happened. Um, Russia continued to mobilize, and this threw Germany into absolute panic. I mean, Germany had already declared that it was a crisis of the highest order. When this first happened, this assassination occurred, Germany was basically looking at this as the greatest crisis ever. And they're paranoid because they're in the middle of Europe and they've got France on their west, a country that's openly antagonistic toward them and Russia on the east, which is a country that nobody can seem to figure out, but makes moves that are mysterious to everyone and seem menacing. So July 28th, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia and begins the invasion and bombardment. And the invasion, by the way, was not successful, which is uh, a foreshadowing of the war because Austria-Hungary, as soon as the war begins, displays their... Um, their inherent weakness. Um, you know, it's like your uh, Ohio State and your ally is Temple in football. All right. And you're Russia, you know, you're uh, Southern California and you're going to the aid of Rice University. And that's, and you're going to destroy your program on that. All right. Um, So you got the German paranoia that these people are out to get them. You got the Austrian anger at Serbia, but their fear of Russia and their dithering, dragging out of everything. And you got Russia giving these answers that are very unclear and they do things that are very mysterious. So Russia says, oh, don't worry, it's nothing to worry about, you know. But they start to mobilize their army, their military Navy army. 
against Austria-Hungary and Germany. Now, this is the strange thing. Now, Germany says, well, what, you know, what the hell? Because you're mobilizing your army towards Austria-Hungary to frighten Austria. But yet, the Russian war plans call for a mobilization of their military toward Austria and Germany. Remember, Germany and Russia shared a common border at this time. So the Germans told Russia, okay, let the war stay local. No one cares. No one in the world cares if Austria-Hungary fights Serbia, okay? That's a local war. It doesn't matter. No one cares about that. But we have an alliance with Austria-Hungary, and if you're sending troops toward their border, not to mention our border, it is a guarantee that a war will break out. This is what the Germans were telling Russia. This is a guarantee. This is not like a hypothetical uh, consideration. This is an absolute fact that we will attack Russia with the full force of Germany. So don't fool yourself. And the Russians say, well, well, they just keep saying it, you know, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Meanwhile, Germany is looking at France on the West and France has already put their country on alert preparatory to war. Germany has they know it's not even secret. They know what France is doing. They've put their country on alert preparatory to war. And the Kaiser advises the French president and governing, and it's kind of an interim government at the time. I'm talking about the prime minister and the uh, parliament. The Germans say, look, this is so serious. I mean, this is like really serious, like extremely serious. We have to have a guarantee, like right now, like in minutes. We have to have a guarantee that if a war breaks out with Russia, who is behaving in the worst possible way, that you're not going to get involved. Now, if you don't get involved, fine. We're not going to bother you. We'll fight this Russian war, which is be a, be a disaster for us in Austria, and who knows what will happen. And we'll go crazy, you know, with Germans. We, do this berserker rage and all that, and we're a very dangerous country. We have an extremely strong army, a fairly powerful navy. We'd do anything. I mean, you just we this we'll do anything. You understand it? So they're telling France, this is very dangerous. It's a very dangerous and important time for you right now. Very dangerous, extremely dangerous. You have to give us a guarantee that if the Russians attack us, and the way they look at it, if they mobilize us and attack. You're not going to get involved. So the French send a response of, well, uh, basically the response is, we're going to see what happens. That's not a guarantee. That's basically saying we're going to jump in. It's the way the Germans look at it. They say we, and they basically told them up to August 1st, this is your last chance. You have to realize this is the last chance. If we don't have the guarantee in hand. You can expect unbelievable results, the worst possible results. Now, France, they had already been planning to fight Germany for years, so they were all like, you know, worked up and going wild over there, and they were ready to fight. So, because they thought they were going to win, Russia's hitting them from the east, we hitting them from the west, get our land back. So, Germany never gets any kind of straight answer from France. I mean, they get answers, but they never are a straight answer. They don't know what Russia's trying to do. So they say on August 1st, okay, and you know, you can keep reading these state papers. You read through the, all the state papers, you can see there's like growing hysteria. And, and then the Germans, remember now, the Germans are thinking the whole time, we're probably gonna lose. <laughs> like our country's gonna be destroyed. That's, that's their general thinking that we might win, like we could possibly win, and this is the best opportunity to get a victory. But the probable result is going to be really bad. That was a general feeling. So we're going to go all out, and we're going to wipe these people out. They're screwing with us. We're wiping them out. I mean, that's just their attitude. I'm talking about from the Kaiser to the common man on the street in Germany. The socialist parties across Europe, you know, the international socialists said, oh, well, when the war breaks out, all the common working, working people, the proletariat are going to rise up and it won't be a war. That did not happen. The German socialists all suddenly became German nationalists, saying in a Deutschland 
uh, Uber Alice, not the international. Same thing happened in Russia to a large extent. Italy, uh, France, and Great Britain. So all the socialists fought for their own country. They all of a sudden became national socialists, nationalist socialists. The leader of the Socialist Party in France, uh, Jean A, days before the war broke out, as the war hysteria built, he was shot and killed on the streets in Paris by a right-wing uh, French fanatic who looked in, on him as a traitor because he was going around calling for all the French workers to not fight. Um, August 1st arrived, Germany received no sort of satisfactory message or reply, so they declared war on Russia and France and immediately began the great invasion of France. France, well, because their plan was to try to knock out France. This was off March 2, deployment 2 is what they call it. It was based on some studies done by uh, Schlieffan, old German, who had passed away before the war broke out, our commander. We're going to hit France with five armies. Hopefully, we could score a decisive victory in France on a battlefield like at Sedan, Sedan in 1870. Then we could start moving all the troops east to face the great Russian onslaught, which they believed would take weeks and weeks to happen because Russia was considered, you know, really incompetent and backward and uh, kind of a befuddled country as they displayed in their war against Japan in 1904, 1905. <clears throat> But surprise, surprise. <laughs> now, okay, so you got to remember this war is happening on different fronts. They're having the Austrian-Serbian war down there in southeastern Europe, which is not going that well for Austria, by the way. Not to say that Serbia was a strong country by any stretch of the imagination. They were not. Just that Austria was a really bad... You got to remember, this is a country that's never, basically never won a war in its history. You understand? You're going back to... <laughs> Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You look at the history of Austria, they basically, Austria, they basically never won a war. So that's who you're going to team up with, right? So they're fighting down there and they're doing poorly. No surprise if you've ever studied history, they they doing like they always do, terrible. Germany gets ready to make this huge invasion of France. The Guns of August, that's the book by Barbara Tuckman. Well, there's one little problem. Luxembourg and Belgium, the Kingdom of Belgium, are in the way. Formerly parts of Germany, Luxembourg was a part of Germany during the days of the German Confederation until 1866, and Belgium was part of the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, the Heligisch Romisch Reich, until the 1790s. But they didn't want to be part of this German Prussian controlled German Empire. So the Germans sent a telegram to Belgium. Well, Luxembourg isn't even going to try to resist. They only have like a thousand people in their army. So they just say, we wish you wouldn't attack us, but what can we do about it? They just stand aside and let them get, let, let themselves get invaded. Belgium gets a telegram from Germany. Look, we got a very serious emergency that's broken out. These French people are being horrible. You know how they are, they eat frog legs and they, they, they wear berets and they're terrible people. And, uh, we unfortunately have to invade France. Now, here's the problem. This is basically what the telegram is saying to Belgium. I'm just interpreting it in a fast way. Here's the problem. Your country's kind of in the way, <laughs> kind of like on the invasion path. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to come through Belgium with these five armies. If we knock a fence post over or something, we'll pay for everything. Don't worry about it. Any kind of expenses that you occur after the war is over and we win the war, you know, as I said, when we win the war, We'll pay back everything, you know, with interest. Don't worry about it. So just stand aside and let us come through. On the other hand, if you were unwise and you had this idea that you would resist the German invasion, you have to be advised that your country will be facing an extremely angry and powerful army, which would be ruthless in every way. And that... Um, all these terrible things would happen to Belgium and it would be all your fault. <laughs> so Belgium says, uh, no, you can go, you have a common border with France, just go attack there, you know. If you come through us, we're gonna fight. The Germans say this would be a very terrible mistake. 
but Belgium refuses to allow them to come through, so they're coming through anyway. Here comes the German army. Belgium resists a lot better than Germany had first believed. They thought they would fire a few shots and stand aside just, you know, to maintain their reputation. And they could understand that. They wouldn't really care. But uh, by golly, the German, the Belgians fought back with actual, actually some success. So Germany is being held up. They're holding up the German army. They've got to get through Belgium. So they keep getting held up. So they start really blasting through that country, you know, this blast and everything, you know. Well, there's Great Britain. <clears throat> They're not about to let Germany bust through Belgium and go into France and annihilate France and become the predominant country in Europe. That is not going to happen. They just got to figure out a way to jump into war and make it look like they were forced into the war, right? So they start, you got King George V, his father, uh, Edward VII, had done a lot of traveling around Europe during his nine years as king, and he had lined up a lot of people against Germany. He never did care for Germany. So George V is, you know, very amenable or favorable towards getting going after these, these sauerkraut eating, you know, beer drinkers. So, um, well, they say, hmm, we don't really have an official alliance with France, so we can't use that pretext because we can't say they attacked our ally. We're not really allies of France. So what can we do? What can we do? Oh, they find a very obscure treaty that was signed in 1839 that no one's ever heard about. So the British tell Germany, remember you signed that treaty with uh, Belgium in 1839, promising that you would never attack Belgium in case of a war. The Germans say, no, we don't know about that. They're at a meeting, you know, in Berlin. Oh yeah, look, it's right here. Well, first of all, there was no German empire in 1839, so that was a treaty with other parties, you know, Kingdom of Prussia and the German Confederation. Even the British Foreign Office advised the King's government that <laughs> that that treaty couldn't really be used to protect Belgium, that it was more just like an excuse. Because the British themselves would always violate neutrality at the first drop of a hat if they needed to. So they knew that was a flimsy thing. But it looked good in the press and most people don't study anything. They don't learn, they don't study, so they'll believe it. So the British say, oh no, if you go through Belgium, if you don't immediately evacuate Belgium, we're gonna be forced to invade, You know. Uh, uh, declare war on you to protect poor Belgium, even though we've been shadowing your ships for two weeks. Uh, I mean, for a week, and um, we've been in a state preparatory to war. But you know, whatever, whatever. Our media is, you know, the British media and propaganda machine is past masters of framing, framing an event towards our advantage. Plus, the American media, specifically the New York Times newspaper, is a known Anglophile asset, the president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, Princeton University, is a known Anglophile, and the inter the banking interests in New York and New England are known Anglophiles. So we can spin this in a way that would be quite advantageous to the British, to the interests of the British Empire, don't you know? Oh yeah, we may be forced to intervene in this hideous conflict. So uh, the Germans say, oh, what? you know, they're caught off guard. Well, they, although they sus suspected that the British were going to try to jump into this. Oh, no, no, you you leave us alone. <laughs> you know, the German added, you leave us alone. And the British say, oh, no, boy. It looks like we'll be forced to intervene. So um, the king... In Great Britain, only the king or the queen can declare war. But of course, we know they've done, they do that in con Congress with the parliament. But if you look on that royal website today, the British monarchy website, they have a list of the queen's powers and they'll say, uh, only the queen can declare war. Whereas in America, it has to be Congress. At least, it, not that they ever declare war anymore since 1941. But um, okay, well, whatever. The British go to war with Germany August, what, 3rd, and now the British BEF, British Expeditionary Force, comes across to aid France. France. They're not going to do so well. The British are, uh, uh, they, they don't have their greatest uh, 
wartime leaders at this time, I'm talking about military leaders, they don't do the greatest job, but they're there, they're on the ground. That's gonna really help France resist uh, defeat. And when we say Great Britain declares war on Germany in August 1914, what do we mean? We mean the Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, the Dominion of Canada, Newfoundland, which didn't join Canada until 1949, by the way, is at war with Germany. We mean the Union of South Africa is at war with Germany. We mean the Empire of India is at war with Germany. We, need, we mean Australia is at war with Germany. We mean New Zealand is at war with Germany, and all the British colonies are at war with Germany. As you can see, Germany's got themselves in a real pickle now. The British have an alliance with Japan since 1902. They talk to the Japanese, oh, look at those wonderful German colonies in the Pacific Ocean and in China. Just think, if you declared war on Germany, you'd get most of that. <laughs> so of course, in 1914, Japan declares war on Germany. Why, they have some animosity towards Germany? Oh no, but they just wanna grab land. What does Japan do to help, help the, their European allies? Nothing, but Japan does immediately start to attack all German territories in the East. They attack the German uh, territories in China, They, had, which is that town, Weewai. They attack uh, the Marshall Islands, the Caroline Islands, the Northern Mariana Islands. Australia immediately invades Papua, the German territory of Papua, and New uh, and uh, the Solomon Islands. So, and then of course in Africa, the Allies attack uh, all the German territories in Africa: Namibia, German East Africa, uh, Rwanda, and Burundi. So, um, well, Germany is going to lose all their overseas territories eventually. Now, this book is interesting. You know, they talk about the world politic of Germany, and they say, uh, and I have some interesting things in this book, The New Map of Europe. I, I put some highlights. I know you're not supposed to write in old books, but I mean, you know, well, I'm using it. The belief of the German people, this is British propaganda, the belief of the German people in the superiority of their race, their ethnic group, the Germans, and its world civilizing mission is a sober fact. They're talking about how the Germans believe that they, they're the superior race, 1914. The anthropologist Wultmann said, quote, the German is the superior type of the species, Homo sapiens, from the physical as well as the intellectual point of view. He also said, the time is near when the earth must inevitably be conquered by the Germans. So they find some guy who nobody's ever heard of, and they say, this is, the, this is proof, the Germans. Paulson remarked, humanity is aware of and admires the German omnipresence. Uh, here's what uh, Wilhelm II said at Aachen, et la Chapelle, 1902. It is to the empire of the world that the German genius aspires. Well, we know William II had a tendency to say ridiculous things. Here's what the book says. The, the, does the propagation of an ideal lead inevitably to a blind fanaticism where the dreamer becomes in his own imagination a chosen instrument of God to shed blood? There is undoubtedly an intellectual and idealistic basis to the German militarism and to German arrogance. And they go on and on about the politic of Germany. And uh, okay, but the reality is that the British wanted to run the world as they had done, as they had done since 1689. And they didn't like challenges to this and as they do today with their uh, junior partner, America. Today, the senior partner, supposedly, possibly, perhaps. Here's what the book says. The entry of Japan, this is page 43. The entry of Japan into the war is due to her desire to remedy a great injustice, <laughs> which has been done to Japanese commerce by German occupation, blah, blah, blah. All right, that's irrelevant. Here's the poignant quote from the book. The entry of Japan into the war in 1914, probably to the intention, now listen to this very carefully because this was written in 1916. You hear what I'm telling you? Quote, 
probably to the intention of occupying the Mariana Islands, the Marshall Islands, and the Eastern and Western Carolines in order, you better listen carefully, in order that the Japanese Navy may have important bases in a possible future conflict with the United States. 1916, Japan is grabbing those islands to plan for a possible future conflict with the United States. Well, well, but no one knew anything was going to happen in 1941, right? No one knew. How could anyone know? All right. The German army comes pouring into France, pushing the Allies back from the Belgian border, slower than they had hoped. There's some fighting along the southern part of the border between Germany and France. I'm talking about the area that extends from uh, Switzerland up to Luxembourg in Belgium. All right. Meanwhile, guess who shows up unexpectedly on the German border in East Prussia? Oh, well, two Roman, uh, two Russian armies, two Russian armies show up in days. They're not supposed to invade for weeks. So now Germany is being invaded in the east by one Russian army led, led by Renenkampf and another Russian army led, led by Samsonov. Now you can imagine the extreme panic that breaks out in Germany. While they're invading France, and it looks successful because they're heading toward Paris with these five armies, Russia is invading Germany from two directions with two complete Russian armies. <laughs> now, um, meanwhile, their ally Austria is doing horrible as expected down there in uh, Serbia. Now, what about Italy, the great Italian, Ita you know, Italy, Italy tells the Austrians and Germans, hey, you know what? That alliance was if you got attacked. Well, you're doing, from what we're looking at, you're doing all the attacking. We pulling out the alliance, the Triple Alliance. So they withdraw from the Triple Alliance and say they're neutral, which means immediately that Russia, Great Britain, and France start to work on Italy's mind and tell them, well, you know, you could join our side and you know those territories that Austria owns, Tyrol and Fayume and <clears throat> other stuff? Um, at the end of the war, you could get those territories. And Italy stupidly listens to this talk. And they joined the war in 1915 to their total dismay because they do terrible for three whole years and get their ass kicked by Austria-Hungary and then later Germany and they lose 600,000 soldiers to take over land that they would have gotten anyway if they just stayed neutral, more than likely. What about Mussolini, the great socialist radical leader of Italy? Benito Mussolini, oh yeah, you heard of him? He was the editor of the Avanti magazine, Advance, the renowned Italian international revolutionary red socialist magazine. He was the most, you could say, communist leader in Italy in 1914. The radicals radical. Well, you see, when Italy goes to war against Austria-Hungary and by extrapolation Germany, because they're allies. The socialist party, party of Italy says, we're not gonna get involved. All good socialists, reds in Italy must stay neutral and not fight for this banker's war. Now Mussolini had this bad problem. He was a nationalist at heart. He says, what are you talking about? He's telling his own party. He's the leader of the socialist party in Italy. What are you talking about? Our country is attacked. Our great king, Victor Emmanuel, our great king is a socialist. Our great king, Victor Emmanuel of the House of Savoy, has ordered all Italian people to fight against the Allies. Viva Italy! Viva Victoria! <laughs> He's going crazy. He says, any Italian that does not fight for his country, I'll grab a gun and shoot him through the head with a pistol, you know, with this pistol. God, you know, he's not gonna say God save Italy because he's a socialist, you know, godless socialist. But, you know, by golly, 
I'll kill the man who doesn't fight for Italy. So the Socialist Party says, you're, you're a traitor to the international socialist ideal. And he's expelled from his own part, party, the Socialist Party of Italy. <clears throat> so on a dime, Mussolini becomes the greatest anti-communist fanatic in Italy that you've ever seen. And the greatest and stupidest nationalist leader in Italy that you've ever seen. And he starts his own socialist party, a nationalist socialist party called the Fascist Party eventually, which in 1922 takes over Italy, actually hired by the king of Italy to run the government. All right. So that's an interesting story there. Okay. Uh, the red shirt becomes a brown shirt. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. A black shirt. In Italy, they were the black shirts. I'm talking about, you know, Germany, they were the brown shirts. All right, the S8. So here's Germany. <laughs> are they in a pickle or what? Now, immediately, the British are going to start shadowing those German ships. As soon as war is declared, they're going to start attacking those German ships. And the German navies bottle up there in the Falkland Islands, and they are wiped out. There was a big German victory over there on the coast of uh, Chile, Chile out in the uh, Pacific Ocean, and they tore up some Ger uh, British ships, which was an interesting because it was the worst British defeat on the high seas since the Napoleonic Wars in over 100 years. So that was a great scandal in Great Britain. How could these Germans whip up on our Navy? But for the most part, be, aside from some isolated German victories on the high seas, the British Navy does prove that they're the greatest Navy in history because they start to whip up on the German and Austrian navies. And by the year 1915, the German Navy is bottled up in the Baltic Sea, and that's about where they're going to stay, bottled up. Yeah, I know about the uh, Untersee boat, the U-boat campaign. But, the, you know, the U-boat campaign was really instituted due to a failure of the German Navy to um, break the British and French blockade and later Italian blockade of the Central Powers. The Triple Alliance became the Central Powers. Uh, later in 1914, the Germans did talk the Ottoman Empire into joining their alliance, which was about the dumbest thing any country could ever do. Here's the Ottoman Turks, a wretched, horrible Muslim empire with a history of the most outrageous atrocities toward Christians, I might add. An empire that had no worth, no value, that contributed basically nothing to the world for hundreds of years. But they were big and they ruled Egypt and uh, the Middle East. And they lasted a long time. But by 1914, they were on the way out. I mean, this country was dying quick. They had a Sultan, the great Muslim Sultan, who's also the Caliph, the leader of the Muslim world, the Sunni Muslim world at least, who was mostly a figurehead. <laughs> And they allowed themselves to be manipulated by the Germans in joining the war. Now, when the Ottoman Turks joined this war, the British and the French said, goody, because that country is dying out. We can attack them and grab all kind of land. But as weak as they were and as quickly dying as they were, they shocked the world because the, the Ottoman Empire, those guys could fight. <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, they learned how to fight or they rediscovered how to fight. And those guys fought tooth and nail on all battlefronts throughout 1914, 1915, 16, 17, and they did not surrender until October 30th, 1918. The British Empire and the French caught so much hell trying to defeat these Turks. I mean, this was supposed to be a house of cards that would fall when you blew on it. You know, just, it's going to blow over. Could not believe. I think the British lost 60,000 men just trying to take over Mesopotamia, present-day Iraq. 
So what a fiasco that was. Did it help Germany ultimately? Not really. But did it help Germany stay in the war longer? Yes, because it bottled up a lot of British and French and New Zealander and Australian troops that otherwise could have been fighting on the Western Front. Well, we're going to close out this uh, hour. We haven't even gotten into that, you know, strategy and tactics, have we? Or the role of propaganda or the Zimmerman note or any of that. Well, what happened? This beer is not bad. It really is not bad. Okay. Those German armies, five armies, got within 14 miles of Paris. It looked like France was gone. They were going to surrender, right? 14 miles. I mean, that's from here to the New Orleans airport. Well, wait, that's like 17 miles from where I am. That's, that's down the road. So it looked like France was going to be knocked out the war. Now, if France was knocked out the war, maybe, and I said maybe, Germany, Germany themselves believed maybe we've got a chance. France gets knocked out the war. They surrender. We can get our troops out of there and some kind of way defeat the great Russian bear. You know, I mean, they're looking at Russia with the greatest fear. I mean, like, it's like terror, right? Well, there's this old guy, this old general who should have been retired forever, basically come out of retirement, gambling over there in Paris. This old guy, like, you know, you'd like laugh at him if you see him in a restaurant, right? Stumbling around. This old French guy, you know, he's probably got a cigarette. But he's looking at those maps. This is, you know, the French people are kind of peculiar because they're comical. You know, you laugh at them. They dress frumpy, you know, they have a funny way of speaking. But don't, don't fool yourself. These people are lethal. Just like the British, they cross their legs and wear shorts and drink sherry and some people say they act like girls and they say bloody hell and oh dear. And uh, you can make fun of them all day and all night. I understand that and I do myself. But these are very lethal people. Great Britain is probably the most lethal country on the planet. They'll have you killed. I mean, they'll wear a three-piece suit. But they'll have you killed. All right, now. Uh, and they eat chutney. All right. Um, and hot cross buns. Now, he's looking over these maps. He realizes... That you know, the disposition of the German troops is not advantageous to the German advance. He realizes that the German army has passed in front of Paris, and in a general sense, they're 14 miles from Paris. But the way they're arrayed is they're facing this way, but Paris is that way. So what they've done is they've exposed their flanks. Now you got to remember these commanders all the way through until 1918 are thinking on a Napoleonic, uh, along Napoleonic lines. So that's how they look at battles is this, the cavalry comes in here and the, the front line moves up here and the flanks do this and this. Okay, that's how they're looking at it. They're not looking at it, it's 1914. We have high powered uh, weaponry and the advent of air power. They're not looking at it that way. He says, you know, like, uh, Mon Dieu! You know, Le Bosch <laughs> have exposed their flank. We must rush all the French, we must rush all the French troops to the front lines. Tout sweet. These sauerkraut eaters have exposed their flank. And that's what the French do. They rush all their troops up to the front lines and they hit the Germans with a body blow that you would not imagine that these, these people could do. France is a great country. France may be having a rebirth, especially in light of what's going on there today. 
Don't be shocked to see that phoenix rise from the ashes. Unbelievable. The shock felt across Europe. This great French counterattack begins to push the Germans back, 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 back towards the Marne River. Now, of course, the Germans, being Germans, are going to fight like Germans. The general is killed. The colonel takes over. The colonel's killed. The commander, the captain takes over and commands the uh, unit. The captain's killed. The down to the uh, corporal is killed, and then the private is in command, and he commands himself. So the Germans are going to you know, they're going to retreat in order. They don't, there's not a con conception in the German mind of, of a panic, retreating in panic. That does not enter into their minds. So they're going to retreat in order, but they're going to retreat with haste. And the, the great battle of the Marne, or the miracle of the Marne, as people call it, occurs. And then eventually, by the end of 1914, the battle of Western Europe has settled down into a trench warfare a warfare a stalemate a line of trenches that run from switzerland who very wisely has not gotten involved in a war since 1815 i might add all the way up to the atlantic coast in at in belgium <clears throat> and then the german high command including the kaiser realizes we are in the gravest danger this country may not survive because remember what i said earlier their idea was that if they could beat France, they might have a chance to win. But they've lost the battle to defeat France. So the general attitude going forward is, <clears throat> we've lost this war. Now we got to figure out how to survive. Now this is the attitude. We've lost the war, and we've got to figure out somehow that the German nation can survive. Yes, they defeated the two German, uh, uh, the two Russian armies invading East Prussia. The Battle of Tannenberg, uh, the, the, these two Russian armies were defeated very decisively, in fact, by the equally brilliant uh, generalship of uh, Lord von Hindenburg, a German noble, by the way, a Junker, an East, East German noble. So we have Gamelin, who pulls off the miracle of the Marne. Yeah, old people can do great things. And Hindenburg, who's what, 64 years old, pulling off the Battle of uh, Tannenberg, the great victory in the Masurian Lakes in East Prussia, which really, in a way, Russia never can recover from this, because Russia, here's Russia, you know, they're, they're invading Germany. They're on the road to Berlin, and their two Russian armies are defeated by one German army, Two Russian armies are defeated by one German army. This this guy uh, Hindenburg is another. He's another Robert E. Lee. I mean, he's a genius, a genius, a genius. And um, a stalemate descends across Europe. Yes, there's a war of movement in the east. There's no trench warfare. Essentially, it's this, but it's a movement like this. You push me west, I push you east. You push me west. I push you east. You push me west, I push you east. This does not benefit any of the combatants. On the western front, we have this situation. You push me a mile and a half, I push you two miles and a half. You push me three miles, I push you one mile. This goes on for four years. These countries annihilate each other with this madness. We're going to get into tactics and strategy on the third installment. Um, what do the Muslim Turks do? Well, they do their typical thing. Now, these Armenian Christians, Catholics, or Eastern Orthodox Armenians, decide foolishly, prompted by Russia, they're going to rise up against the Turks in 1915. Okay, you're going to rise up against the Muslim Turks. What is going to be the response of the Muslim Turks? Well, actually, the same response that they've always given you. They're going to give you the Muslim response, meaning they're going to rape every woman they find, age 101 to 2. They're going to enslave all the young boys and women to make sex slaves out of them. They're going to murder everybody. They're going to burn every village. They're going to kill everybody. They're going to crucify 
all the people on crosses, in fact, they're going to martyr all the Christians, and they're going to kill one million Christians when they counterattack. Well, you know, you say, oh, you're picking on the Muslims. I'm not picking on the Muslims. I'm just saying they were just, hey, they were just Muslims being Muslims. And I don't pick on anybody for being what they want to be. Not to say that I would have objected to the Russian Empire absolutely annihilating the Islamic world in 1878, but uh, anyway, I mean, that's how they are. I mean, if, if a pit bull bites somebody's face half off, I wouldn't say, I can't believe it. I would say, it's a pit bull. Those dogs do that. It's a Muslim. They massacred a million people. Well, hey, you do what you do, right? You, you do what your uh, character calls you to do. But anyway, that's, you know, that's another story, but we don't want to talk about that because it's offensive. So anyway, um, thank you for watching part two. World War I was terrible. It should have never happened. It caused millions and millions, 10, 10 million people, if you want to lowball it, to die for basically nothing. It made the world safe for communism. And that's about it. <laughs> Thank you for watching this video production.